All right. Welcome to the Cape Elizabeth School Board Workshop on Tuesday, November 28th, 2023. And our first um, item on the agenda is public comment. So if there's any, if there are any members of the public that would like to comment tonight, please, I'd say step forward so that the owl can catch you and make sure you give your name and address. And the board will hear what you have to say. Okay. Seeing none, we're going to move on to item number two, the review of our ongoing equity audit. And we have Joe Prasad here with us tonight. The floor is some, I feel like it's yours. So I'll just say a little and Michelle can add any. Um, this work actually, you can get up, Joe, please. <laughs> I'm like, this is twice we've sent her to the seat. She's not going to come uh, back. We've sent her back to her chair twice. So this work began actually several years ago um, before Michelle and I actually were even here. Um, so it's been important work um, and Joe's been working with people in the district and the community for well over two years now um, learning about us. Um, I think you're going to learn a lot today um, about what she's discovered as she met with students, staff, parents, community members, administration, a lot of people. So we're excited to have you uh, and have the board and the public hear what you have to say. So Amazing. Welcome thank you back. for having me. Hi everyone. First and foremost, thank you so much for your support and attendance at this meeting. I am, as always, thrilled to be in the Cape Elizabeth community. And we are at the harvest. Um, let's get right into it because there is quite a bit of information. So. This is the most important slide I am going to share today, and that is my gratitude. So I could not have given recommendations without being able to speak to you, without being invited and welcomed into this community. And for that, you will have my absolute thanks. This is what we will do in offering super brief methods, pops, needs, remedies, and questions. Questions is at the end, but as always, if there are questions at any point, please jump in and ask. I would love to be able to like do it live. So if there are questions while a slide is up, quick raise a hand or just a shout out and I will absolutely pause. Is somebody paying attention to the Zoom for a question or how does that? No, 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 no. Oh, who did you talk to? Recording. <laughs> oh my goodness, guys. I'm so sorry. Here's my offering. Decide where you will go and then go there. When you live by intention, there is no limit to the rich rewards that life can bring. Give yourself a clear direction for this day, for this week, for this beautiful and unique life of yours. Give yourself a clear direction and you'll have a workable path to your own special greatness. And this is by Merjam Stoffels and I highly recommend her website seven to success where she has a bunch of different um, offerings and I specifically chose this one because as we move into 2024 and we start reflecting and maybe some of us are going to be setting intentions or resolutions for the new year this is what I hope you'll do you'll live with intention and it also matches the work that we're doing now which is being intentional and setting our goals for our future <coughs> so what I did during this time, specifically phase four, was come back in to the community and I met and did several focus groups with many of you, <clears throat> many students, many, excuse me, several students, many different adults from and different stakeholders. I also was invited to classrooms, I was invited to PDs, and I was able to look over lesson plans. And from that, plus the static data, collection that I did in phase three. We have, and all the other time that I've spent here, we have this presentation. So this is a brief reminder that when we are talking about matters of race, sometimes it might seem like, of equity, excuse me, it might seem like, hey, how come you're not talking explicitly about race? Remembering that if we just plop on race into an inequitable system, we're not doing any anybody any good. So a general evaluation of the topic is necessary and is an equitable practice 
as it reflects upon whether the system itself is equitable and then allows for the incorporation of inclusion and diversity alongside the nuances that they require without implosion or collapse, aka we make it sustainable and something that can be done long term, which is the purpose. These are some pops and these are just some of the great things that I was <coughs> privy to or that I heard and I want to say that like this is, I could have made the whole presentation just pops. There are some great things. The students are engaged and wanting to learn. The students are, we have students here. So like talk about engaged students. They're here, present, being a part of wanting to create an inclusive school culture. So that was seen. Uh, you have responsive admin, again, who are here. You have community members who are engaged. You have real world learning. You have a community that wants to do this work and is curious about it even if they're unsure, which is really beautiful to see. Oh, and great learning and great teachers. Thank you teachers for being here. <laughs> so these are the areas that we are going to focus on and I was fortunate enough that they also spell out CAPE. So uh, we have community engagement. I, oh, I can look there, but <laughs> community engagement, academics and curriculum, professional development and teacher training, educational inclusivity and school environment. And then these are the sub areas of the areas of emphasis. And I do want to say that this presentation is shortened for time's sake and brevity and clarity. Um, so if there's something that you feel like, hey, what about this? Please again, ask about it. I'd be happy to talk about it. So moving forward, into our C. We have our four core entances, and these are our four core understandings. So have we all heard of a double entendre? Right, so just like that, this is the same. So these four, on every slide that we have, we have our four understandings, and they double as a need as well as the solution. So whenever, as we're talking about community engagement and advocacy, Whenever we're thinking about some of the problems we might have with communications, when we are bettering it, we're also working towards the solution. So thinking about it in kind of a concise manner, as well as this order, I feel like leads us to better outcomes. So what are some of the things that we would like to see? But first, because apologies. Communication versus discourse. If I go back to the slide, you see that number one is communication, number two is discourse. Words matter, understanding matters, so I often will provide what I mean by these words. So communication is the ability to express information. I am communicating with you right now, right? But we are not necessarily engaging in discourse because I am not listening to your positionality on it, and we are not necessarily having a dynamic exchange that leads to the foundation for informing forward progress. So whereas communication might be one-sided, discourse is always <coughs> like at minimum, there's two of us or a group of us. And I really want to bring our attention here. It serves as a foundation for informing forward progress. And I say here that without that, it's simply a conversation or a debate. So that is the big difference between discourse. Discourse has an intention. Okay, so when we piece our community engagement and advocacy together, this is what we would like to see. We would like to see various channels of communication. Parents and, well specifically parents, would actually like to have communication in a way that they can receive it in a way that they will see it and can engage with it more meaningfully. How that looks, if you are a parent here and would like to tell us, we would be happy to listen because admittedly, we'd like to do a better job of that. Interparental, how can parents come together and how can CAPE facilitate a meaningful discussion between parents so that they feel like they also have a support group within CAPE Elizabeth? 
And then we want our response to the communication to be proportional to sentiment. We don't just want the loud voices to be heard. We want it to match how the community feels. It's okay to express things loudly and passionately, no problem. And it is important that our efforts and our attention still match how a majority feels. Discourse. So right now we are a little bit afraid of stepping on toes, of we kind of want to save face. We're, we're scared of retaliation. How do we eliminate that? We have to learn how, and we have to have the time opportunities, time and opportunity to practice. Our expectations. We have to have expectations for the schools. We have to have expectations for our parents. And we have to use those to come together and have accountability and partnership within our Cape Elizabeth communities so that our school resembles the culture that we want here and it extends into the home collaboration around discipline, curriculum, and the embedding of values. <clears throat> discipline here just means that we are holding people accountable for the actions that they take. We're documenting, we are, yeah, holding accountable and just having expectations for how we comport ourselves. The curriculum that looks like parents, teachers, as well as administration coming together to standardize and have a curriculum that we all are in support of as we make changes to have more inclusivity in our curriculum. Nobody feels surprised. People have their voice heard. People can say, what about this? How about that? How do we go about it? We're making sure it's developmentally and age appropriate, um, but we are progressing towards a curriculum that has windows and mirrors embedded into it, as well as make sure that our diversity of learners also have access to the curriculum. So that said, this is our priority. We need a culture where we have proactive communication and productive discourse. A reminder that this is a learned skill. It takes time, vulnerability, and perseverance. And some of the benefits will be collaboration, trust, stronger community, and the ability to engage in difficult conversations and value-based decision-making. Something that I heard a lot of was the values that CAPE has and how do we bring <coughs> them into our schools. And it will come through this discourse because we want to become a community that just doesn't say this is what we are, but our actions speak for them. So academics and the curriculum, our four points are curriculum, assessment and alignment, collaboration, content, methods, and student success. Expectation versus accountability. So expectation is the mutual understanding of an evaluation, uh, evaluation criteria, and what is required for the other person in a given situation. And accountability is the method by which you will be held responsible for the agreed upon expectation. Um, and again, we want to make sure that those things are clear and if any changes are made, that those are clearly communicated and that nobody feels like they're going to be held accountable for an expectation that they were not aware of, because that's just not fair, but it does happen, right? So when we piece it together, what we're looking for is standardization. And what this looks like is we're all kind of learning. We are all learning the same things. We have the same scope and sequence. There's no uh, kind of ambiguity about the topics to be covered. And we do this horizontally as well as making sure it's going vertically as our children progress through the grades so that we make sure there's a continuity of learning. And if you have students in different classes, you don't need to be worried about how come you're doing this and you're doing that and why does it look different, right? That's what our standardization provides. An equity and diversity criteria. We have so many different wonderful students at our school and all of them deserve to feel seen and deserve to have access to the curriculum. So this is equity of access as well as windows and mirrors and telling stories and having different situations 
different situations where people can see themselves as well as see others as well. Expectations. So if we standardize but then have no expectation of how it's going to be used, then we've done work for no reason, right? So we standardize and then we set our expectations. We make time for collaborations with teachers but as well as with the community. We make time to express to our teachers, hey, because we have standardization and expectations, you are still able to teach in a way and a means that feels authentic to you. That's why you're here. That authenticity, your authentic teaching style is meaningful to the students. You will have that flexibility in that. And we will make sure that any changes that we make when we are telling, uh, I always use Christopher Columbus, nobody's surprised. When we are talking about Christopher Columbus, we'll make sure it is age and developmentally appropriate. We are not, we are going to make sure that you are there, you are part of the conversation. Then we move into our content and methods. We, when we are presenting our content, we don't just want to say, okay, look, here it is. We want to have a conversation surrounding it. Why is this like this? How did it become like this? What are, what are the, what are the processes or the systemic nature that leads to this being an outcome? That's a counter narrative. And then we're going to have training because our teachers need to feel supported as they engage in this work that might be out of their comfort zone. They deserve to feel like, okay, I was empowered with the tools that I need in order to be able to provide those counter narratives and feel good doing it. And our students deserve real world learning where they are going out into the world and seeing some things that are applicable to what they might experience in real life. Learning cannot remain in the four walls because we are sending them outside of these four walls and so our learning should reflect that. Student success. This is massive and this is honestly why we're all here. Our school is for our students and so when we are thinking about student success when we are thinking about what we want for them as well as what they want for themselves, we need to think about if we're thinking about them as a whole person. And a big thing here, I'm going to start here, is the psychological safety and mental health that they deserve and is the foundation for their success. A calm body, a calm mind is a learning mind right? And we have some students who do not feel like they have the psychological safety. Now they feel like, okay, no one's going to like physically hurt me, but is somebody going to advocate for me when somebody said something derogatory? Am I going to see myself represented in this curriculum? Am I going to be celebrated and given the space that I need when I need more time to process an answer? Or am I going to be cut off? How am I made to feel like I belong here in this school, even if I do not fit the stereotypical cape mold that I believe we can break down so that we don't have that and students can be their authentic selves. <coughs> but how are we creating that psychological safety? How are we breaking down mental health access barriers? How are we making it so, oh, you don't get along with your guidance counselor? No problem. Here's this avenue for you to get and see the services that, that you need. How are we as a school making it feel like, hey, you need a brain break or today's not your day and you need to go see your guidance counselor or the psychologist? No problem. And nobody is holding that against you. We're creating a culture where we understand that mental health is an integral part of their academic success and they feel that way. It's not just in word, it's in feeling. So they can feel empowered to take advantage of the resources that you have at the school. Accountability and school culture shift. So this is looking like when we hear something and we say something, when we shift our school culture, then we are saying, hey, that kind of language isn't isn't acceptable here. That kind of teasing isn't acceptable here. That kind of rhetoric isn't acceptable here. And I as the adult, especially as the teacher, turn and say something. 
so that you look at me, even if we, you know, don't have the hierarchy in our classrooms, or might be some people are eliminating hierarchy, I'm still the person, the adult in the room, who is going to be your advocate. And I am going to say something because I'm going to uphold our school culture shift. I'm going to make it clear that you belong here by holding the person accountable. And we will progress until everybody understands that this is a way of being. This is the way Cape Elizabeth is. We don't just say we're inclusive. We show that we are inclusive by holding people accountable so that everybody feels as though they belong. And then when we look at academically, thinking about how much homework our students have, our grading policies, yes, we want, we want our kids to be learning as much as they can, and having so much homework means that they're not having, they're, they're doing homework, they're doing extracurriculars, everyone is so busy, and yet they have so little time to themselves, for themselves, to get to know themselves, because they are doing so much homework, they're not sleeping, they're not, they are literally eat, breathing, school. And they're starting to come to a point where it's, hey, it's a little bit too much. I think it can be successful and not have four hours of homework a night. I think I could be successful and an A is not a 93%. So just thinking about these things that our students are asking for and their advocates are asking for. So we need a culture that celebrates multiple forms of success. This is my priority that I'm advocating for. And this is not a reduction of rigor. It asserts that we have different skills. And a school culture that excessively celebrates success as sports and academic is provincial. And ultimately, the world wants us to have different skills. If all of us were teachers, we'd have a problem, right? If all of us were professors, if all of us only wanted to be administrators, we'd have a problem, right? If we all wanted to be singers, the world benefits from all of us having different strengths, and we need that, and we need to celebrate it. So not just say you have different, different strengths, and that's fine, and that's okay, but showcase it and be proud of it in the same way that we're proud of people going to certain colleges. We can do that. We can. Be intentional about celebrating proportional success in different arenas. Every single person deserves that, to be seen for their skills. And when you are seen for your skills, then you can reduce the pressure of conform conformity, inadequacy, and you can feel seen and accepted for who you are and what you have to offer. And then we see our students kind of coming alive and feeling like, I can step into these doors as myself because I don't have to worry about if I'm not the smartest, I don't have to worry about I have to take this class, I don't have to worry about I have to play this sport. I can do the things that I want to do that bring me joy. I can center my joy. And students deserve to learn how to center their joy. Our P's are professional development and teacher training, intentionality, collaboration, practice, and accountability. When we bring those together, it looks like time, giving our teachers time to have the trainings, to have the collaboration uh, that they need. It looks like an educational shift versus initiative because we are tired. Teachers are burnt out. Everybody's coming with, we're trying this now, we're trying this now. Let's not try things anymore, and let's shift a culture of practice to something that, regardless of who is standing in front of you as your administration, this is something that benefits you. We're looking for things that are long-term and sustainable. Collaboration, so creation of inclusive materials is needed. No, no curriculum or program materials are perfect, so how do we create the materials that we might need for our matching scope and sequence? Let's collaborate and find out. How do we, how are we being proactive in communication with our students and families? You need to be part of this collaboration. 
you need to be a part of what, okay, this is what we're teaching. This is not what we're teaching. We need more gender inclusive sex ed. Hey, I think our teachers need more training in IEPs. Uh, that's fine. But we need a time that you and the teachers and the administration come together so those needs are heard and a plan of action can be put into place. Students saying, hey, I felt like that was like performative and we didn't really dive into to what any of that meant. Okay, wonderful. Let's talk about it. And data cycles. Let's see how we are doing. When you have an aligned curriculum, a standardized curriculum, now we can take assessments at similar times and we can evaluate our students' performance. And that is really important, seeing as their success is why we are here. Our practice. So, a community teaching practice culture. Hey, I'm going to try this new thing. Could you come watch me and tell me how it's going? Wonderful. There's no shame. It's like, hey, teaching is iterative. I want to get better. It's really hard to like do that myself. I'd love a fresh pair of eyes. And creating that open door policy where we can realize that, hey, if somebody's here and wants to help me be better, that's amazing. I should embrace that. That's what we want. Peer observations. And then flexibility in interpretation that again is the teacher is allowed to interpret the scope and sequence as they would like <laughs> in their in their execution of the lesson so if you're saying hey i want to go partner with portland high school wonderful they're doing something and i want us to join it's in alignment it's regard it's in order wonderful go do that it does not matter that you're not doing the same exact worksheet. Accountability. So evaluations. You know, this is where admin comes in and making sure that teachers are doing the things. We've set our expectations. We're giving you the training. We're giving you time to collaborate and practice. Okay, let's evaluate and see where you are. This is not punitive. This again, it's an iterative practice. Teaching is not static. It is dynamic. It is the best part. The students and then you're like getting to like figure things out every year. Expectation of inclusive design. Again, we have so many different learners. We have students who are multilingual <coughs> learners. We have students on IEPs. They are all in the same classroom, which is amazing, which means we get to learn from each other. They get to learn from each other and that's beautiful. And we need to cultivate the space and have our inclusive designs so they have access to those materials so that they feel like I'm here, I'm a part of the, of the classroom, my teacher will make it so I'm able to participate and feel like I belong in this classroom. I will be given the space, time, and grace and access points that I need. And my bar is not lower because I need this. No, no, no. I'm still, I still have high, the same high expectations and standards as everybody else. I just get the supports that I need in order to reach that bar. And so this expectation of uh, inclusive design is key and obviously the alignment's been spoken about. So the priority here is a standardization of curriculum expectations and use uh, um, and accountability for implementation of best practices. So standardization and expectations are not in conflict with teacher autonomy. I hope that is very, very clear. However, or moreover, it does contribute to an equitable educational experience for students, and that is paramount. So lastly, our E is educational in inclusivity, school and school environment. So we have mental health, expectations, <coughs> advocacy, belonging. I did touch on this already when I was speaking about student success because our school environment, how our students are learning, the environment in which they are learning is tantamount to content. If we are teaching content and our students do not feel safe, they are not learning. That is just scientific. If they feel like they do not belong in this community, they are not learning to the levels that they can and that we want them to, frankly. So once again, access, making sure that Students have access. It's not just, hey, it's here. How, let's write that clear path. This is how you get there. You do not have to navigate it on your own. 
when you are going through a mental health crisis, whether it be momentarily or long term, having to navigate that on your own feels impossible. I know that personally, and so I wouldn't wish that on any any of the students, right? So let's break down those barriers so they have the access. Safe adults in the building, we need to make sure that our students feel like they have somebody, anybody to turn to. Somebody. So that, again, when adults look safe, when they see something and they say something. And I, I do want to make it clear that when you do not say something, you are you are saying by virtue of inaction, which is an action, that that is fine. And the victim is left hurting, no longer feeling safe. So we cannot be silent. We have to say something. We have to show that we are safe. We need K through 12 continuity. So there's a great SEL integration in at Fon Cove that is amazing. How do get that into our middle school and our high school. I'm not saying it's not there. How do we fully, fully like, how do we make it integrated so that we are still talking about our emotions. We're still regulating ourselves. We're still able to have those difficult conversations about that really affected me. And I'd like to maybe have a dialogue about why you did that. That seems that's what we're looking for. Expectations again around collaboration. This looks slightly different. This is collaboration around, hey, the school wants to do this. This, we, we, your, your student can't go on this trip. Parent. Okay, well then, that's what we are, we are supporting the school. It looks like parents and the school coming together <coughs> to maintain the expectations that we have for our students. High standards. So once again, these standards, we cannot bring the standard or lower the standards for some while saying, oh, we have high expectations of, for our students. We cannot lower the expectations because we have written that student off. Again, what does that say about my belonging here? School culture shifts keeps coming back to this. Remember, when we shift our culture, we change our actions. And when we change our actions, then everything falls into place. And so that is what we are looking to ultimately do. Advocacy. Our school IEP referrals are mostly parent-based here. We all think that that is interesting. So I encourage, I encourage our teachers, our um, social workers, to get active and make those recommendations where they see fit that you are in the class with these students, you're seeing it. You are their advocate. Accountability, again, that looks like seeing something and saying something. It also looks like admin, if I am a student and I come and I tell you, so-and-so did this really harmful thing in class, it looks like the teacher being also held accountable. Uh, utilizing funding for increased inclusion. So. How do we put our money where our mouth is, so to speak, um, and say, okay, hey, we're having this event. This is awesome. Uh, let's also make sure that we put in extra resources for a sensory area or a reduced sensory area. How are you making sure that whomever is coming feels like I have a place to participate in this? How are we making it so there are sports and clubs. Can we maybe get some more teachers or, you know, an outside person who might be able to host a club so that there are alternatives and things that the students are interested in and belonging. So that ties here. How are we using our money for these things, right? Because nothing's free. We do understand that. So how can we work this in on our spend our money here? Oh, speaking of accountability, I do want to say teachers also include our coaches, right? Anybody who has access and touch points to our children. Uh, inclusivity for diverse needs. Again, making sure that no matter who you are, you feel like you are seen. Period. And then differential treatment. So differential. 
here. Differential treatment means treatment is based on needs. And preferential is based on status. So sometimes we make rules that are flat because, and that is equality, right? Because we want to eliminate any preferential treatment. Right. However, sometimes when we do this, we're missing this. So somebody who really does have a need, somebody who might need in order to feel comfortable in this new and big building to just see it in advance, this would be a differential treatment and that would be an equitable move. That would be something that you were doing because you need it, not because, not because you want it, not because you desire it, not because it's your preference, because you actually need it. And I wanna be very clear that differential treatment is not synonymous with unmerited. And it's very important that, that that is named. So our priority here is a culture where our vulnerable populations thrive. And I do want to make sure I include our BIPOC populations. They deserve to thrive. That is at the intersection. Every population I, I named, BIPOC is at that intersection. And if we're not doing it without race, then we're not doing it with race. And that only in ups the ante. So to thrive, I mean that we have a sense of belonging in this community, inside and outside of the classroom. You are given the supports needed to academically and socially thrive. You are made to feel seen and included. You are defended, you are celebrated, you are safe. All of our students deserve this, especially our vulnerable populations that are often in the margin. So I think of it as a bell curve. We're doing for the 68%. We need to move out to those standard deviations. We actually need to look at them first. And so we've come to kind of the, where do we go from here? How do we even get there? What are the stepping stones? Well, while I was talking to you all, you, came, you gave me the 11 core standards that I call CAPES. These were either what we see in our community or what we desire in our community. And that is community, <coughs> communication, collaboration, and celebration, accountability, progress, expectations, and equity, standards, sustainability, and student success. How do we get there? We throw away the troublemaker A's, which is avoidance, appeasement, and assimilation. These were the, these were the most common barriers to getting to where we wanted to be, to making it so the things we see are actually the things we do. Avoiding those hard conversations, we're scared. Appeasing in order to avoid the hard, hard conversation. And assimilation, this one is big, right? When we feel like we all have to be the same, when we feel like we're not going to fit in, when we feel like I'm going to neglect my culture, my past, my language, my sports, my hobbies, because I need to be an academic and an athlete, then we are assimilating. And whether or not we want this to be, or whether or not we think that we are doing this, this is how people feel. And that is, our students feel this way, our parents feel this way, and it is being seen and it's being felt. And again, students are unable to center their joy, center who they are, because they are assimilating to a culture in order to feel like they belong. And that is the irony. So where do we start? We start by community building. We start by having opportunities to have those conversations, just neutral ones, starting just by being together so that we feel less like we have to avoid anything, right? We start by setting parameters 
around our communication and how we communicate with one another. How are parents communicating with our administration? How do how does administration communicate with our parents? It's a two-way street, and we want it to actually be one that is meaningful and proactive. Reactive when it has to be, obviously, but that propagates the change that we actually want to see and is fruitful. How do we rework our mission statements so that like I did in this presentation, you know what I'm talking about. You know when I use certain words, you can look back and say, ah, that's what she meant. How do we have something that, like our offering, sets us up for our success? This is what Kate Elizabeth stands for. This is our very clear, with precise and direct language, this is what we stand for and this is what guides our steps. How do we create our working definitions so that when you step into the CAPE community and we say equity, we say inclusion, this is what we mean. And because we know what I, we mean, it's embedded into our policies. It's no longer vague. So then we have to goal set and prioritize. We, we can't do it all at once, and that's totally okay. Might seem like, are we doing anything? And the answer is yes. If we're spinning our wheels and staying in the same place, what's the purpose? Let's be intentional, right? It's about <coughs> being intentional. And so this is already um, under underway in part. And we want to review, the schools are going to review their disciplinary procedures so that they incorporate the values, so that it's victim-based, so that it is restorative, so that there is documentation and there is accountability. This is not meant to say, oh, you're the bad guy. No, not at all. And we understand that without accountability, there is no change. We are going to locate the areas of need, um, the areas that need expectations, and we are going to continue the curriculum review and implementation. It might seem like a lot, but it's chunkable and doable with time. This is just where you start. And my favorite, include the students. So no, would I ever ask you to leave? Are you kidding? Are you kidding? Never, 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 never. Thank you again for being here because ultimately they are why I am here. They are who I do this for because education is a service industry. And as soon as we forget that, we, we've lost the plot. We, we've, we've lost our way. We need to empower them. We need to advocate for their needs above all else. Even when it does not match what sometimes parents might say, we are advocating for their needs, their desires, as students and as people. And so as we move forward, Let's measure twice and cut once. This is just a quick little checklist. We are going to bike. Yes, bike, okay, everyone? Just <laughs> let it go, let, let it go. We're biking, okay, I've decided. <laughs> and that means that everything we do, we're going to look back and ask ourselves, does it bring more belonging? Does it bring more inclusivity? Does it bring a celebration of our differences? Does it bring equity? And with that, I thank you. Um, it has truly been an honor to be here. I've always felt welcome here from minute one. I've said that. So thank you so much for inviting me into what feels like your home. This is your home. So thank you for inviting me into your home and your community, allowing me to work alongside of you. That's it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so a real chance for the board to interact with Joe, ask questions, give comments, uh, school administrations here as well if you have questions for them or thoughts. Yeah, you're great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, and thank you, that was lovely. Um, I imagine as you do this work in different schools and different settings, there are common themes that you probably hear quite often were there any um, surprises that you came across in, in your work here? Something that was that you don't necessarily 
I would say that the biggest surprise was that um, families felt like there were so little access points to each other. Um, and that was that was a little bit surprising because Cape Elizabeth is fairly small. Um, and the sentiment that people came in with was we're kind of like a tight knit community and yet it felt like we also have we also don't talk to each other and so it was that was that was probably the biggest thing that i was like other things like oh people are pushing for success absolutely and that's increasing but that was probably the most stand out that it was like no we don't we don't really talk um this is i this is my first time here and i encounter with any of this so i feel like my questions are, are going to be kind of repetitive so I guess uh, this was all very informative, but um, is this uh, like what happens next? Those um, things? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can go back. Oh, no, no, no. no I, I, I was like reading them. I guess I was just wondering, like, from like a more concrete than conceptual basis, like, is it like, or is there a schedule of policies that we're reviewing? Are we going to set up community forums to have discord? Like, that kind of so that is sorry Chris, I, gotta, I gotta do the head turn the <laughs> that is so i provide the recommendation i'm happy to be like there to be a thought partner but basically i say like these are the areas that i would start in how do we start i think it starts by having small community meetings and enjoying time together reading books together they're um you know today actually your awesome principal your awesome high school principal is like we have this great book to, to read and you know why don't why don't we do things like that so that there's something that we are gathering around starting to practice talking to each other around how do we build that community and then we broaden out okay and it it, it will seem slow and incremental and we're literally rebuilding so it will be small slow and incremental and at the same time the review process of the curriculum is underway so there will be like multiple kind of things happening at the same time so the community aspect will look one way the teacher aspect will look another way and there will be like a venn diagram where there are aspects of collaboration is a massive theme there right so there will be avenues about like okay here okay we're collaborating on this and because we've been practicing our community discourse we also feel like more prepared and adept to have these conversations with each other in a way that we maybe weren't before does that answer that does make sense i guess from, is, will there be is there phase six i what, what were so could we see what phases one could i see yes <laughs> yeah, and this has been quite a process that Joe's been with us throughout. So there's been several phases along the way. For me, right now, it's a lot to process. Um, we spent some time with Joe this morning, and we had an even deeper dive. Two um, hours. <laughs> and it's difficult on the spot to prioritize what to start with, um, besides saying this was courageous on behalf of the school department, students, staff, parents, community members, administration to engage in. Um, we were willing to ask ourselves some tough questions to get to know ourselves a little bit. And that often reveals some things maybe we don't want to think about, uh, about ourselves and about who we are and what we're doing as a district. But uh, we've learned a lot from this, but I, I need to sit with this more and talk with the district leadership team and they need to spend time with their staff and then we need to move forward. Um, but learning how to talk to each other, uh, have discourse, like I, I, I think I move out of my superintendent role and just talk as a, as a I guess as an American, a Mainer, uh, I think that's a desperate need. Um, how do we talk to each other when that we have divergent views? Um, we better figure that out, right? Mm -hmm. um, and schools are a good place to do that in a relatively safe place to do that but um, we have much to work on with professional development um, of the climate and culture of our schools although we have great schools and wonderful schools um, but there's more to do and we want to make sure every student feels safe welcome 
they belong, they're excited to be here. So, is there like a bigger presentation of like actual things that you're working students that we would be able to kind of just look at? Um, so, I made a promise that there would be no like identifying, or I did oh, not yeah, use yeah, quotes yeah, or anything. So, um, even like, I guess. so Caitlin, I think we'll Sorry. be doing that. We'll be doing that work now. So, it's, it reminds me of the curriculum review process in that we look at the data. We have data now. We have some real tangible things to respond to. And now we take that and we make our implementation plan. So, we were just talking about that today on how is that implementation plan going to best be organized. So is it a school level, and some things are district level, and some things are community level. So we're already in the process of thinking of that, of that tangible, how does this break down and great information, all the investment of the community, of the staff, uh, in this process, the students in this process. So how do we take that information and not lose the momentum that comes out of it? So yeah, there will be. And you're, you'll all hear more information at the next board meeting uh, when you hear the student experience survey results. And that is going to inform some of this work, and it's going to even push you further at all of us. What do we do, right? Because all of this is like we're excited about it. We want to make improvements, but we also want to do it right um, and make it sustainable. Um, so I, I think, I forget how you say it, Joe, um, but making sustainable change, it's no longer uh, a fad or picking yeah. the next best thing. It's a, it's a shift. And that a takes. Shift, not initiative. Yes, so thank you. I really like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I did too. So, is the student experiences survey the experiences that they had going through this process with you, Joe? Or? No, very, that was what we um, presented or had students uh, take in May. Okay. Um, and students from fourth grade through 12th grade. Um, oh. And that data uh, will inform the board, it will inform the public, it's certainly informing our staff of some highlights, things we're doing really well in areas we need to get better at. Um, and I'll say it that night too, um, but it was courageous on behalf of all of us to ask the questions, because uh, many people don't want to. They don't want to know. Um, but the only way we're going to get better is if we're courageous enough to ask and then take action. I think it'll be interesting to see how that survey overlaps with the work it that does. we've done yeah. in the community. And just <laughs> for people that may not have been part of your process but still had a voice over here. 100%. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that was fabulous. Oh, I appreciate it, thank you so much. And will this presentation be available online? I know that, so I know I probably will have questions and I was I felt very responsive every time and then I'm sort of like, okay, what, but what was the last one? I've already, like, what? So, <laughs> so we will, we will that post ability it. To, we, purposely did not post it beforehand because we wanted you to hear Joe speaking about mm -hmm. it. Um, mm -hmm. That was really important. We didn't want things to be misinterpreted. So um, her presentation will be posted Great. Uh, tomorrow morning. I know a lot of us are probably just sitting here like you. It's We need to think about it and sit with it a little while. And I want to go back and remind myself. And if there are questions that aren't answered or as they arise, do feel free to, to contact me. I will Absolutely. say, I do like that you provided definitions for each word. I think that that really provides a level of clarity and um, understanding across all. <coughs> Thank you. Joe, I'm going to put you on this. I'm going to turn to you. Oh, uh, no. And then we'll probably finish up this conversation. But I want to be clear leaving here. When you were talking about standardization, I stumbled over the word, but. Um, that's not meaning every teacher is on page 13 on Wednesday. No, 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 okay. no. Just clarify what you mean by that. So standardization is like this is the scope and sequence. This is the order that we are going in. Um, and then within our content group, we will look at that and say like, okay, uh, because we're going in this order and this scope and sequence, we can create like. This is about when we want to have this done and this done and this done. You create a timeline. Great. Let's have some shared assessments. Wonderful. How you go about teaching between this time and this time is, is up to you. Um, how you go ahead and, of course, using our materials. So it's not like 
and then you don't use any of the materials. No, we, that, that part is, no, the curriculum expectations around use of the curriculum, right? But that doesn't mean that you cannot go and say, there's this really cool experience or there's this really cool um, experiment that I want to do in addition. There's nothing wrong with doing things in addition and no, you're not going to do page 13. If you look at that and say, my kids don't need this, then, you know, you are still the expert in your classroom. It is just so that, okay, this is about what everybody, if I go into your classroom and then I go into Michelle's classroom, everyone will be talking about a similar thing, give or take 1.1, 1.3. And so it's like, okay, and you can expect that these are the materials that we're, we're using so that we know, like, okay, we can hold you accountable because this is what we expect the kids to be learning and we expect them to be learning about it in this way. We chose this book because of the windows and mirrors. We do expect certain things and we, we vetted it. We want it used to a certain extent. I'm glad you said windows and mirrors again because I know what that means because I talked to you about it many times, but can you explain to everyone else what that, what that means? Yeah, so uh, when you look in a mirror, you see yourself, and when you look outside, you see something that is different and maybe outside of yourself. And so we want to create the ability that, hey, I see me here, and also, and me being like, my me is obviously different than Chris's me, so I want an opportunity to see me, and I need an opportunity to see Chris. And Chris needs an opportunity to see me. And so I want to see my mirror and I want to look out the window and see Chris or Clara or John. I want to see that. And I want Chris to have the opportunity to see himself and then look in the mirror and see me and see Michelle and see me. So those are the windows and mirrors so that we can have experiences and we can learn about others within the classroom, even if we will never or have never experienced something like that. And we, and I always like to point out that we also want to do, do it in a way that kind of humanizes and doesn't perpetuate stereotypes as well. All right. Thank you, Joe. Absolutely. Appreciate My pleasure. Your day here in Cape. Thank you. Thank so y'all again. Well, I'll just stay for the end. You can go, you can stay, whatever you want. Stay. We're going to be talking about the calendar, so. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have to drive, please I'll safely drive. Side. Yeah. Oops, can you hand me that? Is this yours? Yeah, thank you. That piece of paper. All So we are going to move on to um, giving some guidance to our school board members for on the 2024-2025. That just blows my mind that we're I, talking about those. I, I know I don't like it. Years, it's freaking me out. Calendar committee. Um, I don't even remember who's on calendar committee. I'm, yep. I'm laying myself bare. It will I be. No it will be and it will be new because we won't be getting going until after the we're caucus. starting after the. December holidays. All right. So we'll have new members. Um, if I could just set some context to this. Please. Um, so at the end of this, the school board votes on the calendar. Um, you determine the, the final calendar. But to get there, um, we really want stakeholder input. Um, so the calendar committee uh, is comprised of some parents, some, some teachers, administrators, and two school board members. Um, but it's not, CAPE can't just make all the choices itself. Um, we send uh, our students to PAS, um, tech school, and so we need to, all the schools that send there need to have matching calendars within five days. So that can mean only five days are different among all the schools combined. So that really drives the calendar a lot. Uh, those that have been on the board a long time know that. Um, so that's part of the decision making. Some things that uh, we have to figure out though are when does the year start? Does it start before Labor Day for students or after? Um, in my time here we've done both. Um, what do we do with conferences um, in terms of do they happen during the, 
the day or do we shift them out of the day into the afternoon and evening? Um, where do we put our early release days? Um, those sorts of things. Um, what happens on election day? Um, what do we do with snow days? Um, <coughs> we've kind of shifted lately to the model of having a couple of traditional snow days and then shifting to virtual. Do we keep doing that? All of these choices impact obviously where we end. Um, so that's a little bit of background. So I'm happy to hear input from any of you. Um, and you're certainly talking to each other because we don't know who's on calendar committee yet. I think at this time it would probably be good for um, board members as board members, board members as parents, as educators to kind of maybe reflect like what what are the common practices in Cape Elizabeth that work well, feel good, do we want to hang on to? And then what are some priorities that we feel like are a target for change? Things that might not work well or things, maybe we, maybe it's an experiment. Maybe it's just trying something new. So those, are, I think that's probably a good way to kind of have the conversation. <coughs> First thing that jumped out at me, I guess I've got so many thoughts about the calendar. <laughs> Start. Uh, sure. <laughs> I, this is the last thing you said. I think virtual snow days are such an interesting thing because it's something that I think probably makes an incredible amount of sense for the upper grade, but is basically an entire lost day of school for elementary schoolers, at least grades K through three in my experience. I guess I don't have a third grader, but I can imagine it being dramatically different just one year from now. Uh, and so, and in some ways, it's, another one? Yeah. it hasn't been that big of a deal, but in other ways, if, if we have a significant amount of those, th there hasn't been that many of them, so it hasn't been that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. But if there was a significant amount of them, like if there was a week of these virtual days, I think that would essentially amount to a week of lost instruction for, for elementary schools. That's something I think that we definitely have to look at if we had an extended period of time where we were unable to get into the buildings. Yep, and certainly the, the board can make adjustments. Um, if we have something that happens, a blizzard or whatever, the ice storm of 98. 98. Yeah. Uh, so that's certainly something the board could react to um, if we saw that coming. But it does seem like kind of accepting, though, that that's just lost time for kids in those grades. And it's, it's really significant if it's a week, but even if it's a day or two, it's still a, a day or two. And just so we're, we all know that, and I know there's different experience on the board and knowledge, but any snow day, any weather related day that we don't have school, um, that has to be made up. And that, so that gets pushed into June, uh, middle of June now. Um, and there's also Juneteenth, which is a federal holiday that we uh, celebrate um, or will not have school. Um, so when the, if the board chooses to start after Labor Day, as we did this year, um, then that's pushing, potentially pushing us into very late June. So those are the balance. And I hear what you're saying too, Caitlin, because um, virtual days are not the same as in-person days. Right? But the choice is between having a good, profitable day in school versus a virtual day. It's a snow day or a vir it's like, because if we're not coming into the building, it's either not school or virtual school, which you're saying they're the same. I'm saying that for a for younger subset kids, of grades, they're right? The same. Yeah. I think. I also think there's probably kids in different situations. Sure. If, like you're a middle schooler and you're in charge of taking care of your third grader sibling and your first grader sibling on a day, then you're probably not getting that much done. It. Does the, <coughs> the, um, the requirement to have that five day the, the pass issue? And I, I didn't fully understand what you said, but I but I do hear that we have to be in alignment. Does the snow day piece factor into that? I mean, if different schools have That's an interesting out. question. It hasn't yet. I think we tr we start in alignment yeah. within five days, and then things happen to different districts. 
and Cape is in a unique spot, kind of being out on the peninsula where the weather's a little bit different. Right, right. Um, so we don't have to match snow days, or although we do talk to each other and communicate about snow days, but we do not have to match. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So since I arrived, and I don't know what happened before I got here, but we went through quite a process of getting feedback from from parents and staff and students actually and we came up with the hybrid model we try now which is either two or three traditional days then shift to virtual in order to give people that traditional snow day experience um, and also recognizing um, virtual days aren't exactly the same as being in school um, and thus trying to have lessen the impact in June but it's not uh, it's not perfect and I don't know that we have to make any decision on snow days tonight. I think I, I don't think we can. No. Because yet the board's eventually gonna vote on this. And right. This I, is feedback. This is just, yes, this is feedback yeah. time. No feedback on feedback. And um, so I I'm gonna bring it up. I'm going there. Um, can I just Labor ask Day. before you do <laughs> any other comments on snow days so we try to knock off topic by topic? Oh, only that um, I think it's I think I said it's when we voted for this and the um, the uh, kindergarten screening day uh, that okay we've gone through two years of it it is worth seeing how is it working yeah we visit our decision that was you did go through for people who don't know a couple years ago there was a very extensive sort of outreach to get to where we were on the snow day. Um, and uh, I felt pretty good about the time, and even last year. But I, I also hear okay, I've had in both situations. Um, it's not always better to add a day either. There's sometimes wasted days in June, so that was part of the discussion. Um, but it's worth taking. I don't know how we get some feedback. Or maybe, you know, in the, my parent, guardian, and staff surveys that went out, yeah. uh, not surveys, updates that went out Monday. I have a. Uh, survey about the calendar and one of the questions is about snow day. Oh good. Yeah. Okay. Does it break it down by what age the kids are? Um, the questionnaire breaks down by school, sending school. And I will say for this year for the first time I feel like the end of the school year my kids were checked out and I don't know that I've ever noticed that before but the last like 10 days of school it was hard. Um, so, I mean, that's also an aspect to think about, too, is how much work is actually getting done when it's 90, 80 degrees and the kids are just looking out the window waiting for, you know, summer to come. And so, just another factor from a, an older kid perspective. Um, well, studies have been done. It's so different for the older kids. It's I can so see how different. It, 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 it really makes, is. makes an incredible amount of sense for the older kids. Though. And it makes it incredibly difficult to make a decision that works for everybody. And I think those last, in high school especially, those last couple of weeks after the seniors leave, mm -hmm. the rest of the school is just fun. <laughs> it's like how quickly can we can get our skin boards into the beach. <laughs> it's a tricky one. Yeah. It's it tricky. Is. And there's, I don't mean to say something really radical in, in here, but there's no appetite for pre-Labor Day. Like, we start later than basically everybody else I know in my entire life that lives outside of the city. I was about to start talking about Labor Day, but I think we were trying to finish the snow day conversation. Oh, I guess it's like some of it is like thinking about starting the week earlier means you have that buffer for snow days that means you're not pushing into the end of June. I nominate you for the calendar committee this year. <laughs> 13 revisions last year, which is why I think we're having a lot of these conversations because there's so many topics that are yeah. So challenging that I think Heather will Seem all agree with me that too. those yeah. 13 revisions, Chris, I envy your um, diligence on trying to find so many calendars that work because many of them started before Labor Day, ended after Juneteenth. Some of them started, you know, the next topic that's going to come up, I think, after Labor Day will probably be conferences, which is another big area. And it really took a lot of thought and collaboration about conferences, about kindergarten screenings, about snow days, and about whether or not to start before Labor Day that factored into that. And we came out with something that still ended on June 14th and the magic that was worked. And so I think that they are big conversations. 
I'm not saying I know better. Just... Oh, no, no, I just thought maybe I'd tag out this <laughs> now. <laughs> the, sure. There's one thing that is proven I'm, true. I'm into this. Everyone has an opinion about the schedule, and everyone's <laughs> opinion is right. <laughs> right? It's because we all We're live passionate. it. We all live it. We all experience it. That's we've right. done it as kids. We've done it as a parent. We've done it as a professional, and they all... And it's... it's uh, yeah, calendar committee is a good time. Mm -hmm. Right. It was really actually informational. Mm -hmm. So going into the um, conversation around Labor Day, um, I can give a little history. It doesn't... So the history is what Chris said. We have started before Labor Day. We have started after Labor Day. The driving factor has typically been when Labor Day falls. If Labor Day falls early like it does in 2024, it falls on the 2nd. We have typically gone back to school on the 3rd or whatever, the early. And this is just, this isn't saying whatever is right and wrong. Mm. This is history. If it falls later, then we have typically gone back to school before Labor Day. And that is not just in my time on the board, but my time living in Southern Maine. That is a lot of, and not everybody, but a lot of how it works and a lot of, and again, the, the five, I believe even when I was teaching, it might have been we were allowed seven days and then they tightened it up to five days. But the, the PADS schedule has always driven. And so there's not as much leeway around the start as people believe it it might be a couple days here and there it's not like a week because that just wouldn't fly but that's where it's at as far as history the conversation can summer is sacred here. summer is quite sacred here prior to this year we had everyone come back for that thursday so it was first grade through 12th grade do the first day um, and then everyone would have a four-day weekend. Um, so this year we decided to try it differently. So this year, as you may recall, we started after Labor Day. So it would be interesting the feedback I get in the survey about it. This year we got the preview days for school. We had fifth grade and ninth grade have preview days on that Thursday. Yeah. So that would be nice to hear about. Sarah, do you want to talk about how that went for fifth so grade? This has been our second year. We did it, right? We it yep, my we've done it twice. <clears throat> and then we did it again this year. And the feedback, although our fifth grade teachers, you know, were struggling because they had to get everything prepped before everybody else, they have thought it has been a fabulous start to the year. We have all of our teachers involved in that day. So we bring our fifth graders down to the cafeteria and then we introduce everybody in the building so our new fifth graders get a chance to really meet our school staff, see who everybody is, get, you know, just a little bit of information to, to our building. They do tours, they do scavenger hunts, and because in the middle school, our fifth graders really, they don't stay in their little fifth grade wing, they're going to different places in the building. So it's a chance for them to get, uh, you know, a feel for the building without the big kids there, start to do some some wayfinding. It's my favorite term. Um, <laughs> you know, get some wayfinding in there, and figure out pathways to places. Um, so it has been our fifth grade teachers, our kids. Um, I haven't heard a lot from parents, but I think little tidbits, just anecdotal tidbits, has been really, really positive about that, that intro half day. I know John's still around somewhere, so when he comes back, he can <coughs> ask about ninth grade. Yeah, just, yeah, as a parent of a current fifth grader, I thought it was fantastic. I mean, I just, it's scary for the parents. Right, fifth grade to go to middle school, first of all. You know, somebody went to middle school in sixth grade and went to middle school in sixth grade. So just think of the old baby going to middle school. And it felt like it was an opportunity for it. And they came back feeling excited. You know, they were they were there by themselves for just that, just that half day. It made a big difference. Uh, so I think it's a great, I assume it's similar to that, a little bit, probably similar to the middle or ninth grade, but similar idea. You kind of get to be there without everyone, with all the noise and the, and the crowds. Are those days outside of the past requirements? Um, no, they count. So, but a lot of other schools do that too. So, it, if you looked at each of the sending schools opening weeks, they're all unique in a way. But um, there's a lot of similarities. There, there are some similarities as well. 
Um, but a lot of schools do that. Well, they'll bring in fifth grade, um, ninth grade, some. Um, so I'm glad to hear that, Phil. Yeah, I, I suppose. And this has historically gone back the Tuesday after Labor Day. I yes. <laughs> Portland uh, traditionally starts after Labor Day. What about Westbrook? Um, I think they may start before. So I know as we consider multiple pathways as well, then you're now considering if we ended up having any sort of... But I don't know. I'd have to check on that. Mm -hmm. But it is, it's, it's almost like the budget paths, drives everything, and then there, there are those little things that we get to have 13 mm -hmm. meetings about. <laughs> You know, there's just it, there's not a lot of wiggle room, but I'm super excited to hear about how well that went, and I assume that the um, the administrators participating will advocate for that. And we've already heard about it at the board level, so whoever the reps are at the board level can back them up. It it feels like that might be a priority to continue. I like coalescing around something, so <laughs> so. Um, I feel like the before after Labor Day thing, like it's a it's a tricky thing, and we we do need to. Part of it is waiting to see what Paths does every year is sort of like, and my gut tells me because it's on the second that Paths is likely to go right. after. Another, another factor that came up in the pre post Labor Day were staff and related services that report back earlier, like school counselors and things like that, and mm -hmm. how much into August they went. So if they reported back 10 days earlier, that made a big difference in what chunk of summer changed for them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that was yep, factored into it as well. So that will definitely be a part of the conversation. It will. It will. Definitely. Yeah, good way. I'm just thinking, we're like, what was it like? We were having to realize we didn't have this conversation except for Presque Isle. Potatoes. Potato. Like August 15th. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> right. we did. You know that. But then you had, and then we had the break. break. They actually got rid of it in Presque Isle. Some other districts still do it. But yes, we I thought they the brought it back August, some places. Uh, every year, so it wasn't yeah. even a thing, like my entire time growing up. It was the middle of August. But anyway, I but know then, it's a big thing. You're right, right. and then no the harvest memory. break. Right. Yep. It's like sugar in Vermont. Yep. Um, are there any other? So is there? So that sounds like it's something that is good that we probably want to continue. Are there other things that we like about the the calendar? Um, <coughs> I did have somebody ask me um, just in terms of the pre when you start Labor Day and when you if you start before Labor Day and, or you start after Labor Day. Does it affect graduation, or is graduation always going to be the first week in June? John and I have been talking about that lately because, um, and this is this year's calendar, but um, next year's calendar, I think graduation day would be on the first. So yep. we start to think about is that pushing it too early? But then we think, for consistency's sake, probably families have to start planning, and so. I, we voted on that, didn't we, a couple of years ago? We moved it. it. Was, it, it was the second week, and we moved it back to the first. Yeah, we moved it. Having to do with, I don't know what you call them here, Marie's trying to not a senior yet, but in my district we call them capstone projects. Yeah. They're senior. They have, um, how am I even? I should know it off the top of my head. So my child just went through this. Transition projects, thank you. <laughs> STP. Yes, oh my gosh. Yes. The tiredness. Thanks, Cindy. So I think we'll probably establish that as the right, okay. the first weekend but, or the first Sunday. I think just establishing something wherever it lands is going to be really helpful and useful <coughs> to parents, to community members. Just this is how we do it. And then people can plan around it. I remember talking about it and saying that maybe this is the way we're going to go. I don't know if we ever made a decision. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that where we put PD days is going to come up for conversation. 
um, there's, you know, there's been a kind of a move away from the, like the, the PD early release Wednesdays into some of the full day models. So I think it's going to be useful for the board and, and the community to hear how has that been because some schools kind of have stuck with those early releases, some have moved away again. So how is that working for people? And, you know, we, we as, tried to move. We want to hear about it. <clears throat> out of Wednesdays and put them, try to match them up to weekends or mm -hmm. holiday weekends. Um, there's some debate on the efficacy of doing that um, because staff gets to the end of the week and it's a Friday and are they charged up about doing the work? Um, but counter to that is if you have it on Wednesday, you're breaking up the week and, you know, it's, we're going to have a bunch of different opinions. I, I'll speak for Michelle, um, and she can speak for herself, but she's advocating for as many early release days as we can get within reason, um, knowing all the work we have to do. You heard from Joe tonight. Um, we have several curriculum reviews cycles going on. We're trying to build horizontal and vertical uh, instructional and curriculum collaboration. Um, you'll hear from about the student experience survey and some of that talks about um, what students are experiencing in classrooms and how to make it more engaging and more interesting. All that takes professional development, but uh, that takes time, right? And any, any early release time means all of your kids in the community, students are out of school for half a day. And loss so, of instruction. And loss of instruction, so it's a balance. And any full PD day is doesn't count as a school day. Mm -hmm. um, right now we have eight um, that we sprinkle about. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those are used to give some comp time for conference time. So. Yeah, I would say that. And so as you're, it's just another one of those things that you're trying to figure out. We have so many to use. That we use three at the beginning of the school year students in for a great experience and we use one at the end of the end of the year and then we come for um, for conferences we start to see how many cards you have left in your hand so that's just understand that um, I, I certainly agree that we want continuous we want least disruption to, to learn for sure and the, the other side of that scale is what we heard from the need for training for teachers, what you all know for training for teachers, when we're doing this review process, we need to, that's going to come out every single time as training for teachers. So that's, that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. not, um, not taking away that during school year days are important. Is, <coughs> is there, you mentioned that's like the first day and the, the, the last day is being like bad, but it would actually seem to me that maybe having like a whole week tacked on to the end of school to do like intensive, I don't know, collaboration and training would not actually, that's not saying take away from the, the be great. Lesson. It could be a great month. That would mean additional days and contracts. Yeah. We're paying. We get, that would be a contractual. Yeah. Yeah. So is the eight days, is it eight days? That's part of the contract. Oh, so we couldn't change that without. We could go much further out. Those are the eight days we have to write the contract. So anything like that, we'd have to work with the association on and, and compensate and decide it's the right path and get their input. Um, and that's why we have teachers part of the calendar committee um, to get their input. But as you can imagine, as you senior students are running out of steam in June, so are, so are the teachers. Our professional staff. Not administrators, though, they're always. Um, <laughs> One thing we try to do with professional development, early releases at least, is aim to have a touch point each month. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't accomplish that necessarily with this current calendar, but hoping to in the next year's. That's definitely something I've heard in the past about sort of, so the, the model of kind of front loading or back loading is one model, but then the other model of touch points during the school year is that you don't lose momentum and that you 
keep you know you keep the conversation going and you have those multiple touch points that kind of keep keep that learning and that whatever conversation going on throughout the school year <laughs> all right so I've heard about snow days Labor Day fifth grade ninth grade first uh, Sunday of June graduation PD days um, I think that probably at least in my mind leaves conferences mm -hmm. um, and election day Conferences came up. That was a really big topic with the calendar. Mm, there it was. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we tabled that and stuck with the current um, format that we use because we were hoping to have more collaboration and conversation with parents and teachers and sort of the community to get a sense of we're not going to just change this practice that's been here for. How it, since I've lived here, Decades. Um, you know, and so really kind of to just open that up to a little bit more input before considering a big change. Yeah, my the calendar survey that's out there for the public right now, both parents, guardians, and teachers, staff asked about conferences. Did that get sent already? Yeah, that went out on Monday. That's all right. You're busy. Everyone's busy. That's. That's part of the feedback challenge. Is that the blue right? links? I read the whole thing. Yeah, it's in there. <laughs> okay. And it will go out again. Um, but look at it. So that's no, okay. It asks about conferences. It asks about what you hope to get out of conferences. So we can gain a sense of that. It asks about moving them out of the school day. It asks about whether the high school should have conferences in the spring to match what Palm Cove and the middle school do. So I think what the calendar committee will have a lot more feedback. I think what would also be useful is to gain a sense of what other schools are doing and you know we we don't have to be out on an island. Yeah. We're in this, we're kind of almost an isthmus but we're not on an island. So I let's will, I'll research that more but I, most districts don't quote me on this because I'm going to but I my sense is most districts have moved into the afternoon evening model of conference. Yeah. Uh, but, but I'll find out. That's my experience, yeah. but I think it would be useful to actually have, you know, at least like a Cumberland County yeah. Right. Yeah. survey. Yeah. And, you know, is, what does it look like K-12? Yep. Right. The requisite hairy parent of small children here, I find it quite disruptive. <laughs> well, that's, you know, and at the same time, it's tough to lose that, um, classroom time for everybody. And, and I think especially with little, I mean, I'm sure this is true for older kids too. Were you talking um, about conferences completely or conferences during the day? Conferences during the day. Okay. Oh, no, no, I don't, That's... conferences themselves are important. But, like, I mean, I, I find for my kids getting into a routine, having, it's like another two weeks in the year where it's just like a random day off and then they're home, I don't know, it's like they get into a, Teachers at the high school talk about that too. They talk about that there's a there's a rhythm and and a kind of a, a stability that comes from routine. Routine doesn't have to be, and it isn't really a negative word necessarily. It's just my kids have all acted like complete psychopaths this week, <laughs> trying to get back on a routine. That kind of play, I think that plays into the the conference conversation. It plays into the PD conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we've all we really weighed in really heavily on the end of the week around vacation things. I love it. <laughs> My kids, I mean this, this, this moved into play a little bit more towards my uh, younger student, but anytime, I mean, they're already, I mean, families go away. There are accommodations that can be made for younger kids because you might take some vacation around a vacation, so. But I absolutely hear I would say, though, the difficulty of the teachers, you know, there's the balance. But I don't think Monday is necessarily, is Monday worse than Friday? In my life, Monday, Friday, yeah. as long as it's next to the weekend. Friday's better for early release than a Monday. Oh yes, I see that, but for a full day. But we don't have many full days, um, but I hear that. So we'll discuss that. So moving um, on. I think two years ago, the calendar, we put most early releases right up against the vacation, and we didn't find that was particularly effective. Um, we could guess that. So yeah. we moved more to the 
end of the week, but not a, up to a vacation. We think mm -hmm. that's gone better. Or even a long, like there's a long, long weekend, weekend yeah. or something like that. Cindy? I was just thinking, you know, it, using that for professional development like right before a long weekend, I mean, the staff's not there every weekend, too. It just doesn't seem it's fair. tricky. It is. It's a lot of things to balance. John, um, while you were out, we talked about uh, fifth grade, bringing the fifth graders in, how that went for fifth grade. I heard rave reviews from both Sarah and board members. How about the ninth grade? Do you mind coming just that a little closer? On the separate day, yes. Yeah. Um, I think we're in favor of it. I mean, I think that for us, it's compared to bringing ninth graders in the morning. It's not just about our ninth graders. It's about our upperclassmen who are doing the mentoring with them. And it was like their day is also very impacted by um, trying to do that in the morning and everybody being here in the afternoon, which was the old model, it was mm -hmm. very chaotic. Mm -hmm. um, I think, so it's beneficial for the for our ninth graders. It gives them a pace to that first day that is fine. I mean, they, they'll come up in the spring, right? But it's not the same. I mean, they're just, they're here, but I would want to give them a quiz on it, right? Like, they're ready to be out of school. It's like the last week, you know, the last days of school. So I think it's important for them, for me, to think that they're settled that also our upper links can do that in the morning. A lot of them have, you know, clubs are starting practices that are going on already, and then sort of you know, start off together the next day. Um, and we run for all periods of the next day for everybody, and then we get up to sort of the regular schedule. So I would be supportive of it. Thank you. We thought so. Yeah. yeah, I'm in support of it. Great. That's the right thing to do for kids. So, was there... Election day, um, we now um, have the high school's virtual K-8 in person. Um, What's so the I, reflection on that? This is the first year that we did that. Do we have... I think K-8 likes to be in person, um, and the high school would prefer to be in person. I think it's difficult. Um, there's not really another location to run elections. Um, the town asks us to do this. Uh, as we hit the next election, it's going to be presidential and potentially a building project. So we'll probably have 90 percent mm -hmm. voters. So I will share historically, not just as being on the board and I haven't lived here forever and ever, but um, we have not had school closed except for presidential elections until recently. Um, it is definitely hmm. something that um, the town has asked and the school wanted to prioritize school on non-major election years and there was never a problem. And there was also the ability that was really cool of students seeing democracy in, in action. So, and what I think pushed over the edge was just sort of this idea that anybody from the community might be in the school, like a fear mongering, which made me feel sad, but is kind of when the switch happened. So that's a, that's a much higher level conversation even than the board. Yeah. That's you. That <laughs> but is. Um, it is worth thinking about. This is not how we have traditionally done this. It's not, I mean, it might even only, it, it might, it came in while Donna was here. I think for me, this is just me thinking, I personally believe that election day should be a national holiday so everybody has equitable access to vote. It's probably not a big deal here in Cape as it might be in a bigger city but making sure that all of our staff and educators have the time that they need to vote in their own towns. And so if any like teachers are saying, I didn't have time to get back and vote, making sure that we have a plan so that everybody has a right to vote. That's my civic little I haven't heard that. Okay, just want to make sure. We do want everyone to vote. Yes. That wants to. I agree with Jen strongly to the point where I have a follow-up question, which is how does PASS decide their calendar? 
can we petition pass to do something like that? So if pass made election day holiday, then that wouldn't make it so hard for us to make it. If they are the grand boombas of calendar making in the state of in the area, how do we get onto their calendar committee? <laughs> well, you you have attended their meetings. Um, so we well, talked about volunteering to be on the pass calendar. Committee you could bring meeting. that up, but I don't know if. Then you'd be talking about disrupting all of Cumberland County, so right. you've got to be careful with that. Well, I was a beautiful that. national picture. Like, I would love to nationally see, because I don't know that it affects our small town the same way, but I've always just firmly believed that but that's, Election Day should be national holiday. I agree with you. So then I we agree. don't get we to can. change that, though. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get to. But we can send a strongly worded email to pass people suggesting. <laughs> well, they, I think they're facing enough report in school town. Yeah. Yeah. Having this exact same conversation. You can send a strongly worded email to that yeah. person. <laughs> Find me the person. <laughs> and they'll say, thanks, Cape Elizabeth person. We live in Portland. I don't know Portland. how annoying I can be, Elizabeth. Yeah, I, I'm not saying that. Elizabeth, were you, did I hear you say that the, the shift, because I, I, I also remember voting with school going on, maybe I didn't have a team in high school then, um, but that shift happened primarily for security reasons? There was that discussion around I can see that it's definitely colored the conversation because the school department the superintendent the board whoever really were not interested in disrupting the school day except for the presidential election which you're not wrong it's it, it gets a much bigger turnout mm -hmm. on the day um, our town has a pretty robust um, early voting population um, and we don't, you're right, we don't have anywhere else to vote. I'm not, I'm giving history. I wish we could go, I would really like to go back to having in-person school. And, but I don't know that we're going to go there. So that's why I'm asking for, I, I think, how did it go this year? I think probably we can look at that the following year. And also look at um, I, the rest of Cumberland County, right? Because this conversation came up today, I, randomly today, and we conversation with a colleague about how similarly they we only had school closed on presidential and now in where I work we didn't have school at all it was a PD and conference day and so I think that that maybe isn't just a cape shift I feel like it might be becoming more common practice well in places where they don't vote in the schools it's less impactful there you know there are many I'd say most communities that don't have to use their high school. Yeah. It's it's a parking issue. But all that being said, I will work with the town probably not for next not year. Not for next year. I think the conversation that I was hoping to have would be for this coming calendar year, which is <coughs> How do we, how did, just trying to get feedback about this. I, I was excited about it because at least the schools that didn't have to be impacted weren't impacted. So that felt really, progress. Okay. right? That felt good. That felt great that the elementary and middle school students didn't have to experience, <laughs> I say it in such a negative way, didn't have a virtual day. And um, the, the high school students weren't just off without, anything and they had a virtual day which made everybody remember the the year that you know was half virtual and half in person and that was not awesome but it wasn't a waste at least in my household yeah I don't know I'll look into it I'm raising history. I'm raising conversation. I don't know that it's feasible for a president because we're going into a presidential election. We thank you. I see a nod of a histor historical person with me saying yes. So it's a presidential year. It was always. Yeah, that makes and sense. And that makes sense. But we're coming into a presidential election year. And for calendar committee, although I appreciate rich discussion, we're going to try to keep it to the 2024, 2025. Correct. That's helpful. I would also just like to point out the security and safety. I mean, it, it is, it's, it's legit. And it may have been a fear-mongering thing. I don't think it's fear-mongering anymore. I think it's reality. 
And, you know, we're, I was reading, was it your update about popping doors open? Like, that just can't ever happen now. Ever. Ever. And it, there, there's a legitimate fear for somebody who works in a school with high state security now. It, it's still terrifying to think that somebody can access a building like this. And so um, I, I do think that the, the security piece is seriously legit, especially if we can't isolate the okay. area well enough yep. and mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they could get into an area that's full of students. Um, God forbid, but um, I, I think it's real. Very real. Most days are real. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. I think that came up if it's a design. lost day of school, it's a lost day of school. I'd rather they were in school too. All right, I got a lot of good feedback, so thank I, you. I just said one more thing. I know yeah. late hour, so just to talk about later, but yeah. I, I do think we, I, I would like a discussion about the no kindergarten or case screening. That yeah. sort of bothered me last year when I voted mm -hmm. for it. I, I remember saying I'd like to sort of hear some feedback. Mm -hmm. I'd vote for it one more year, but I'll hear some feedback. It feels a little bit like, you know, sacrificing days of kindergarten. And no one else is getting that. If it if it's still the best reason, I would I would still support it. But I'd like to have I'd like to revisit it. Definitely. I think you know our prior principal introduced it two years ago. We renewed it second year. But I still have some concerns. There was a kindergartner at my bus stop, and it was like, why? Well, you know, it, it just sort of feels like we're just not going to have you in the school. I agree. And you know, I get you both screened after school. Um, so I just like to have a conversation about it. Maybe if we end up in the same spot. It would be really nice to hear, is that truly the best practice? Is that the best way to do it? Right. Are we making that, are we sacrificing these kinder, you know, for a good purpose? Right. Also, those kindergartners are out, like, a day and a half, which I, is, is, I understand the wisdom of that, too. Thank you, Phil. That's I remember we wanted to circle I think back Tiffany on. heard that, and we'll be prepared for that discussion when the time comes. Not right now. Not right now. Well, it's also good you're coming in. You're <laughs> well. She's coming in with fresh eyes. You don't. You don't have any sort of. You didn't yeah. propose it. You didn't. Whatever. So you can just look on it with. Yeah, how it's going. It's worth it. Yep. Yeah, fresh eyes and give some feedback. Okay. Any other calendar guidance topics? Yes. Uh, we coalesced on keeping it consistent. So that first Sunday in June. Oh, first. Yeah. That's I what I double check just logistically with the number of weeks. Because yeah. of STP. Yeah, and when it would be exam. So I'll have to like look at that just to make sure yep. that we have the STP week of two weeks available. We tried to make it we went back to where it historically landed, but I have to look to make sure we have the two weeks available plus a senior week to do the American practice. Stuff like that. And go to Monco. What's that? And go to Monco. And, and all that way, yeah. All that senior <laughs> if we don't, if we don't, we may have to go to eighth, then back to the seventh. I'll just have to look at the number of weeks. Which is our missing week. We will have to. Because it's Correct. Right. I just got to look at the number of weeks. Yeah. We, we were avoiding trying to get into that Not three really. weeks STP, then two weeks STP, then three weeks. You know, because um, the three weeks is. For some students, especially equity wise, just their ability to access places and multiple places. Mm -hmm. So we'll hear back on that one. We will. All right. We're good. Anything further? All right. I think we're done for tonight. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.